So, Pete, the floor is yours. A masterclass awaits. Thank you very much, Ray. Um, really difficult topic to, uh, to try and do in 40, 45 minutes. It's a huge topic, and of course, it's as you know me, if you've ever seen me speak before, you know I'm very, very excited about this. Uh, it's my favorite topic, and one that I'm most likely to overrun on. So I've got a clock in front of me with the word end written on it at 20 past 3 local time, and that's when we'll be taking questions and answers. So, how do I go about approaching this topic? I could have this. This is just basically a long list of all the different types of questions you might encounter, and I could sit here and tell you what, in my humble opinion, is the best way of doing them. That would get you absolutely no further forward uh, than you've ever been before, because that's probably what's happened to most of us in our formative years in market research. We went off, wrote a questionnaire, and some um, deity on high said yes or no, that was a good question. It would also be extremely boring. Um, I think it's better to think about principles, because with principles you've got building blocks, and with building blocks you can go your own way and find out that you've done the right thing or the wrong thing. So I want to talk about principles, and the first principles I want to think about is about the most important person in this process, and surprisingly enough, that important person is not us, that person is the respondent. There are a couple of things that we really have to remember about respondents when we're writing questionnaires. And the first thing is that they know they're in an experiment. You may not think about it as being an experiment. You may think about it as your day-to-day -day work. But an experiment it is, and they know they're in it. That means everything that they see, that they hear, that they read, they think it is meant deliberately and has some real meaning. They also want to please. And they think you know what you're doing. So that's the point of doing this bit of training so that you do know what you're doing. Here's something I often like to show when I'm, when I'm teaching on the subject. So I put this picture up and ask the, the audience, what is it? The answer comes back, of course, it's a pipe. Uh, well, as my grip would have told you, it's not a pipe, it's a picture of a pipe. The picture of the pipe has meaning to you. You know that it's a pipe because your culture. You recognize it as being an image of a pipe. If you showed this picture to an Amazonian Indian who had no contact with the world outside, they would have no idea what it was. So everything has meaning. And it's the meaning of what we see that is extremely important, and the meaning of what we write that's extremely important. You're the one who's supposed to know what that meaning is, and that's one of the core principles. It's why we go into questionnaire design in such depth, so we can understand what the meaning is of the questions we ask. Questionnaires do an awful lot of work in the market research world, particularly in the modern day without any interviewers present. One of the first things that the questionnaire has to do is to motivate the respondent, because no one else is going to do that. It needs to motivate the respondent to provide a number of things to us, complete answers and accurate answers. That's what we want from them. It also needs to speak to them. It needs to communicate with them. They need to understand what it is that they're being asked to do is to help them work out how they should answer the question. And it's supposed to make their life easy. It is certainly not supposed to make their life hard. So let's start. Is this the simplest question of all? A simple yes, no question. Oddly enough, it's not. Remember, the respondent wants to please, and they don't want to disagree with you, the experimenter, because you are a scientist. And here's our first problem with questionnaire design is acquiescence bias. Here I'm showing you some quotes from Saris Krosnick and, and Schaefer, and these are academics working in the field of market, field of market research, uh, in this case, uh, University of Stanford. Um, there is a whole world of academia out there that many of us in the commercial world are, are exposed to, and it's well worth delving into it, because they have time to, to think about some of the things that we simply have to do. Let's think about acquiescence bias. Some respondents are simply agreeable, and they aim to create agreement out of politeness, just as we do in normal society. Others, again, with a scientific bent, think the researchers agree with like, whatever is listed down there, and they defer to their judgment. Well, yes, if you say so, I must agree. And then, at some point during the survey process, respondents might be engaging in survey satisficing, and at that point, agreeing is a lot easier than disagreeing, because you really don't have to think too hard just to continue to agree. So here's an example of something that called many names in this instance, it's been called affirmation question. Two different questions, have you used Tide Laundry, yes or no? Which of the following brands of Tide Laundry have you used? If you ever want to know how strong acquiescence bias can be, 
there's the difference in the results between those two questions. You don't have to have a degree in statistics to recognize that they're probably statistically significantly different answers. That's a nine point difference between those two samples. How can we overcome this? Well, you can spend a lot of time if you want to finding people who are acquiescent and excluding them from your sample. Uh, you'll find uh, you're excluding quite a lot of people who otherwise have perfectly valid opinions. The other way of doing it is to follow up how sure are you when you say yes. And anyone who's not 100% sure, recode them as no, which means you have to ask two questions instead of asking simply one. Or just avoid the question type altogether and give alternatives. So choose one of these that best describes you. So you're not telling anybody anything, you're just allowing them to tell you their truth. Here again, I'm going to show you some other examples of affirmation versus multicode. You can see the differences between these numbers. They are always consistently higher with a yes, no. As you read across, it's kind of interesting when you get to the end and see that massive difference in terms of reading People magazine. We might ask ourselves the question, why is that so big? Well, the answer comes because it's another bias. And that bias is social desirability bias. That's wanting to look good. Okay? Wanting to do the socially desirable thing. And that's looking good to society generally. That's looking good to other individuals, which would include an interviewer if they were present. And indeed, wanting to look good to, to yourself. We humans do lie a little bit to ourselves about what we do because we make ourselves feel, feel better. And so people will over-egg a little bit what they think they ought to do and underplay those things that they didn't think they ought to do. Here's a survey that I ran over in the, in the US asking people what have they done in the last week and one of the answers was have you drunk alcohol? Going left to right, we took a, a, a cell phone and landline sample, telephone interviewing, gold standard sampling, fantastic interviewing, got the answer 35% have drunk alcohol in the last week. But exactly the same survey online and got the answer 48%. Uh, so no interviewer present, we have an uplift of 13%. Now we just want to check, of course, that this is not a sample effect because not everybody is online. So from the um, phone survey, we we're able to extract those people who are online and see how they answered the question, which is the right hand bar, and 36% of the people who are online when interviewed by phone said that they drank alcohol in the last week. So we conclude from this that we get an uplift in alcohol drinking online without the presence of an interviewer, so that's a social desirability bias. Of course, it works in the opposite way as well. There's some things that we might think uh, ought to do, like buying books. Over uh, states, when we use a telephone survey, 25% online comes back down to a more reasonable number of 20%. Except, of course, 20% of the American population buying a book in the last week is an enormous number of people. And I don't think the publishing industry would be in quite the difficulty it is if indeed this was the truth. So um, I did a sort of quick back of the fag packet calculation. And coming from the UK, we're not allowed to show uh, cigarette packets anymore. So I did it on a piece of paper here. Uh, looks up that there's 13 billion revenue from uh, printed books. And there's, what, 320 million people in the US. That's about $42 a person. Call it $10 a book, that's about four books a year each, which is one every three months. There's about an 8% chance that you bought a book in the last week, not 20% chance. So each instrument like online, which tends to get you more honest results and has less social desirability bias, it's still there. So that's about twice as many people uh, claiming to have read a book, or bought a book in the last week than is probably the truth. Anyway. How can we go about avoiding social desirability effects? It's extremely difficult. It's pervasive uh, within market research. What we have to do is try to make respondents feel that whatever uh, position they want to take is normal, is acceptable, uh, is the very thing that we want to do. We want their honest opinions. No one will know. It's all secret, etc., etc. So we end up writing introductions to sections that are something like this. I did this when I was asking some questions about um, racial stereotyping and racial prejudice, which is a very difficult subject to get people to talk about honestly. So setting the scene, the sections about social attitudes and values, a lot of talk about discrimination, racial, racial prejudice, different people have different views, etc., etc. There are no right or wrong answers, which is always true in market research, but particularly so when we know we're covering sensitive subjects your honest opinions we're looking for, and then give someone the opportunity to not answer the question if they don't want to, rather than give 
a, a different answer. I'm not sure that this always works, but at least it's an effort, uh, and at least it recognizes, we recognize the social desirability biases out there and existing. It means some questions, of course, simply can't be asked, and we need to be aware of that. So, that's some of the biases that are about the respondents, it's about their own psychology and their own biases that they're bringing to, to the party. So part of the questionnaire design is about overcoming that, and other parts are, if you like, more experimental bias, and by experimental bias, that's you. That's you, that's me, that's us, and that's us with our clients who are not averse to putting a little bias into questionnaire design as well if they can get away with it. So we'll go through a few examples here of that, and we can see where the problems arise. In terms of experimental bias, it's extremely easy to suggest what the answer should be. Here's a question that suggests what the answer should be, which carbonated soft drinks like Coca-Cola or Pepsi, for example, do you drink regularly? Now, you ask this question giving these examples, I guarantee you, you will overstate the number of answers you get for drinks that are like Pepsi and Coke, which are brown or cola drinks, brown, brown fizzy drinks or cola drinks, including, of course, Coca-Cola and Pepsi and any other uh, local brands that you've got. Now, if that's not bad enough, what this question will always also tend to do is to understate questions that are not brown drinks. Uh, brands like Fanta, like 7up, or the lemonades, anything that is not brown in color will be understated by this question. Now, how did this question come into being? It's unlikely that deliberately the researchers put this question in here because they want to get a raised awareness of Coca-Cola or Pepsi, even if they were doing it for Coca-Cola or PepsiCo. They wouldn't do this deliberately. The problem has arisen here because we've used a, a jargon term in the questionnaire, which is carbonated soft drinks. Carbonated soft drinks is the category name for this product. And category names are what our clients use, and category names are what marketeers use, and retailers. And they're also terms that we understand as market researchers because we work in the world of marketing. But they are not the terms that are used by the people who we're interviewing. Now, the, the, the questionnaire writer in this instance recognizes that this is a jargon term and has used examples to try and to overcome it rather than using the real world the real words. Now, this often comes from client pressure, and I've had it myself as a junior researcher, pressurized into using what is the, in inverted commas, correct term for the category, because that's how the client refers to it. We have to be using the language of the respondent if we're going to help the respondent. The other way that we can bias the question is that the question suggests my answer as the questionnaire writer. Testing perfumes on animals involves causing them pain. Do you agree with testing perfumes on animals? Well, you'd have to have a heart of stone to agree with that, having just read that testing perfumes causes them pain. But it's an opinion. It may be right, it may be wrong. It doesn't matter. We're here to find out the respondent's opinion, not to put our opinion. And writing your own opinions is one of the first things that junior researchers get wrong. And it's the first thing that amateur questionnaire writers get wrong as well. They, put their, they fill their questionnaire full of their own opinions believing that theirs is the world view. So this is a bias that's very easy to avoid. You need to be thinking neutrally about the subject. You also need to recognize that your view of the world is not necessarily the entire world's view. So, the questionnaire. What is a questionnaire? The questionnaire is a measuring tool. Now, unlike a ruler or, or a weighing scales, we're rarely measuring physical things. But we do measure frequencies, how often do you do, x, y, z, and we also measure an awful lot of attitudes, to what extent do you think, x, y, and z. So the questionnaire is a measuring tool. If we're measuring frequency, we tend to do it in two ways. One is as a relative concept within a fixed time period. So in this case, what we need to do is define the activity, which is sometimes difficult. What does it really mean to go shopping, to surf the inter internet? What do people understand by that? We need to define the time period, make sure it's the relevant one. And we also need to define the measurement scale. Is it going to be something like always, often, sometimes, never, which is a relative concept. So there's three things for us to work, for work on there. Three things for us to be thinking about in order that the respondent can answer correctly. 
You can also measure frequency as an absolute number, again in a fixed time period, where you only have two things to deal with, which is the activity, of course, and, and the time period. So here's an example of an absolute number in a fixed time period, how many times you take a bath in the past year. There's a couple of things wrong with the question already. One, of course, what does it actually mean to take a bath? And that time period is absolutely the wrong time period for the activity in question. So, in order to get to some kind of precision and correct framing, we might reframe this question like this. How many times, if at all, did you take a bath in the last week? That gives permission for someone to not take a bath. Then we define taking a bath. By taking a bath, we mean actually using a bathtub, filling it with water, yada, yada. And then we also say, please exclude any showers you may have taken. And that starts to become a question unlike one that you might ask your mate down at the pub. Then the respondent thinks, oh my god, I only take showers. He'll think I'm so dirty. So they're going to include their showers in their answer. So in order to have precision, correct framing, and to overcome social desirability bias, we need to introduce the question. Some people only take baths, some take showers, some take both. This part is concerned with bath taking, young, young, young. Yum, yum, and on it goes. And this is why market researchers end up writing questions that look exactly like this. It's about precision, about framing, and overcoming biases. It's not like a conversation with a friend. So we have precision, we have correct framing, we have social desirability we've overcome, and we've made life easy by giving them the answer to this. They only have to pick their own. But Pete, I hear you all screaming. Everything has meaning, what meaning could this have? Does it have any meaning at all? Well, if everything has meaning, then surely the answer scale has meaning as well. And all of the ranges that we use in our surveys actually have meaning. Here's a range of incomes, um, UK incomes. What does it actually mean? Well, if you ask respondents what does this mean, they will clearly tell you this, in fact, is the distribution of incomes. And it's assumed to be somewhat normal which means that the item in the center of the range actually describes the average income. Now, you and I and everybody else in market research recognizes that uh, income is not a norm normally distributed variable. It is actually skewed, but that's neither here nor there. It's what the respondent thinks. The respondent recognizes that as meaningful, that it means normal distribution. So if you have average income, you're likely to use numbers towards the center of the range. If you feel you have above average income, you will use numbers to the, to the top half of the scale. Now what this means, of course, is that by using our ranges, we can manipulate numbers and we can manipulate people. Here's an experiment I did where we used two answer lists, A and B there, and you'll notice that the center of each of those ranges is different. Answer list B is lower than answer list A. According to my hypothesis, this should mean that answer list A gives us a larger average and median income than answer list B, which indeed it does by quite some substantial margin. What this means when you're designing a range for an answer list is that the central banding ought to contain the mean or the median. Problem there, of course, is that's the very thing that we might be trying to find out, uh, which leaves us a little bit stuck when designing ranges. When it comes to collecting real numbers, if you want good precision, and don't think about putting a range on the answer. It doesn't make the respondent's life any easier. They know the answer to the question. They're perfectly com competent to type it in, and they will type it in. And they'll give it to you. You can range it up later for your tables, and you'll get more accurate results. So that was measuring real things, and measuring real things and real numbers. Measuring attitudes is something else that we do. This is another exercise that I like to give to classes when I'm teaching in person. I'm not going to ask you, you to do it, but I don't think we can take this away, um, and you can use this any time you like. I get people to fill in the words that correspond to the scale points for the scale of likely, and to make their lives easy, I put in the top and the bottom, which is not at all likely and extremely likely, and I give them a couple of minutes to go away and think about what words correspond to each of those scale points. Uh, if you do this exercise, when you come back, I can tell you a couple of things for sure. First thing is exercise outcome A is that no one will be able to do it. In the years I've been doing this, only one person has ever come back with uh, 10 completed answers. When I asked them what they were as I got up off the floor, they said, yeah, I'm 10% likely, 20% likely, 30% likely. For I stopped them there. So that's cheating. 
Uh, there are no words to describe those points in the middle. Another interesting thing that comes out of this exercise is to get the group to tell you what answer they gave for five. And some people will write that five is either likely nor unlikely, and other people will write down five as some degree or other of likelihood. And that's a very interesting finding because those two things are incompatible. Neither likely nor unlikely is a, is a zero degree of likelihood. So some people are seeing this as a scale that runs from likely to unlikely, and some people see it as a scale that runs from not at all likely to extremely likely, which of course are two completely different things. I'm going to come back to that. Before that, I want to tell you one of only three market research jokes that I know. This isn't really a joke, I just made it up. So if two men go into the bar and one says to the other, I say, what do you think of the new VW Golf? The other one is extremely unlikely to say, I think it's six. People do not talk in terms of numbers. They do not rate things in terms of numbers. People talk in terms of words, not numbers. So attitude scales have to be expressed in terms of words. Numbers may be universal. But numerical scales are not universal, and where they start from is your own culture. It probably starts at school. This is the rating scale from my work when I was at school. Ten was very good, nine was good, seven or eight were okay, not very good. So everything from seven upwards was around about where you ought to be scoring. And everything below that was terrible, and you were getting failing grades. And that works for cultures that score zero to ten, which isn't true for everybody. Here, for example, is the German school system, which starts with one, which is very good, and ends with six, which is insufficient. So not only is their scale not as long as the UK scale, it goes in the opposite direction. And the faster you, are, you start to ask people questions and ask them to process things, the more they start to rely on heuristics and the more they fall back on their culture. And they'll start to rate things in different ways. And if a German starts seeing things rated as a one, they'll start to think they're good. We see things in the UK, raters are one, they start to think that they're bad because of the way we process information. Numbers have meaning. I want to finish off on numbers have meaning with this experiment from Schwarz back in 96. Took a sample of people, gave them a scale 0 to 10, and off that, 34% used the numbers 0 to 5 to measure whatever it was he was trying to measure. Taking a matched sample, he gave them the scale minus 5 to to plus 5, which of course also has 11 points. It ought to be equivalent, but of course it comes as no surprise to discover that fewer people use minus 5 to 0 compared with 0 to 5 as the rating scale, but it often surprises people to find it's as low as 13%. Those two scales are not interchangeable, even though they have exactly the same length and the same distance between the points. Because that's what scales are trying to achieve. They're trying to get equidistant steps between the points, equidistant mental steps, just as measuring with a ruler gives you a centimeter or an inch, and all of those centimeters and inches are exactly the same. Now, whether you're being very, very precise or not being very precise, uh, you are at least measuring using the same thing. So that's what we're trying to do with scales. So we have to ask ourselves some questions about scales. How long? Should it be is the first question. Let's go back to academia. Why not ask them? They've got time to think about experiments to understand how long a scale ought to be. Unfortunately, academics don't share their opinion. Uh, they argue about this like they would argue about how many angels you can get on the head of a pin. But the general agreement is that it's somewhere between five and nine points. Again, we're looking here at uh, John Krosnick from Stanford University, and he says, that a unipolar scale should be five points long and a bipolar scale should be seven points long. Why, may you ask? Well, because that maximizes reliability and validity. Reliability being that it measures the same thing in the same way every time, just like a ruler. And validity is that it measures what you think it measures, just as a ruler does. It actually does measure centimeters. And then what was that? Unipolar, bipolar. The unipolar scale is the one direction from zero to lots of whatever it is you're measuring. And the bipolar scale is the opposites with, opposites with indifference in the middle. So zero to 10 or minus five to plus five the bipolar scale. So this is an academic conclusion to how, what scale should look like. Unipolar, five point, bipolar, seven point. And you might as well 
stick with one from your favorite academic. So if you ask me which scale to use, that's what I would recommend you use. And if you ask me why, I would say because John Krosnick tells us that it maximizes reliability and validity. And you cannot mix those two things up, which is what that first experiment, the exercise of putting the words on 0 to 10, was all about. So scales have design issues. They also have of display issues. How should we show them? If we want to add in a don't know, no opinion, then we have to think about some conceptual, about the way things look. And we have the idea of a visual midpoint and a conceptual midpoint. When we're looking at the scale there, the conceptual midpoint is neither green or disagree. That's also the visual midpoint of the scale. Now, if you add in the don't know and the no opinion codes, the visual midpoint is somewhere around there where the conceptual midpoint has not changed at all, is still of neither disagree nor agree. If you do this with your surveys, you will tend to skew the data towards the disagree point. This is very easy to fix. All you need to do is to make a space between the last um, code on the scale and the don't know and the no opinion, and the conceptual and the visual then all lines up. So these are design issues about the way things look, because everything has meaning. What order should we present? Should it go disagree through to agree? Or should it go the other way around? Well, if we set it up this way around, what we find is that there is a little bit of an order bias towards those things that are on the left-hand side of the scale. So people tend to use the left-hand side of the scale more than the right-hand side of the scale. We've already talked about acquiescence bias. So there's a tendency to agree. So that's pulling the data in the opposite direction. And there's also a bias towards a central tendency, towards not wanting to use the extremes and be a little more circumspect. So you can see that those three biases are pulling the data in, other direct, in all different directions but are in balance. If we put the scale the other way around, you can see acquiescence and order bias will be working in the same direction and we will probably tend to bias our data towards the agree side of the scale. So better to be disagree through to agree left to right. But then where would you put the answer box? Now, you can put it next to the answers. Now, we did this as, as an experiment here. We're asking people to tell us if they're male or female, just using a toilet door picture. This gave us a 22% failure rate when we went and matched back the sample to the survey with their panel record, which is an enormous failure rate. You'd normally expect to have less than 2% just on the sort of click, click error rate. Now, people process things from left to right. So what we found when we looked at it in more detail was that 98% of the failure was males coding themselves as females. So they processed left to right. They saw their toilet door with a man on it and clicked the button to the right of that. If we'd have done the experiment the other way around, we would have had 98% failures, female coding themselves as males. So it's important where you put things. So that's really what the scale ought to look like, disagree, who to agree strongly with the points underneath it to maximize reliability and validity, minimizing bias, preventing order error. Notice this is not just the way we do it here. We've just done this for a reason, and a reason that we can defend in front of pressure from a client or whoever as to what the scale should look like. It's somewhat old-fashioned, of course. It's just words and click boxes, and we like to do things that are less than old-fashioned, like do sliders. Here we have sliders with visual elements on it, but of course everything has meaning. What does it mean to have your thumbs up? Well, nowadays, of course, it means like on Facebook. But do you always like things that we strongly agree with? Notice that top one is strongly agree to strongly disagree. Bipolar scale, and yet the numbers on the top imply that it's a unipolar scale. So if strongly agree is the far right-hand side, then the far left-hand side is not agree at all if you're on the unipolar scale. So you have to be careful just making things fun, because the respondent needs to work with it. The way you design sliders will affect the data. Here's a slider we've done with, uh, with five uh, labeled points, and we get this sort of data distribution. If we take some of the labels away, we get a different data distribution. If we take them all away, we get a different data distribution. This is all asking the same question to match samples. It's all about the way the thing looks. So be careful. Even with sliders, if you use different distributions, you end up with essentially the same means. You're getting the same answers out of the sample. The people feel the same. They're just using the instrument in a different way. So if we're talking about attitudes and we're talking about scales, we tend to put them in 
in grids. We didn't have these in telephone research or in face-to-face -face research, but we did have them in postal research, and there are very few people in market research today who've got an awful lot of experience in postal research. So let's go and ask another academic who is an expert in postal research, this is Don Dillman from Washington State University. In his textbooks, he describes them as item in a series, and he writes about what a grid should look like and says why we should use them. It eliminates redundancy with regard to stating question, questions and saves considerable space, which is a space at a premium in postal research in a way that it isn't in online research. But he says do it carefully. We should stop making us think. Why should we do it carefully? Well, because items are now being compared to each other, and the way that they've been put together makes them into a unit. If the sponsor, which is the client, wants the individuals to contemplate items separately, they should be presented as individual items. Here's a grid. I've circled two points on the two grids that are the same thing. Uh, the first one says, Sony Ericsson, I disagree strongly, they are leaders in design of mobile phones. That's the point circled. And the second one says, uh, I disagree strongly that Sony Ericsson are leaders in design of mobile phones. So I've been consistent in my answering of these questions. So these two grids ought to give exactly the same data. Now, of course, as you all probably know, they're not going to give the same data. They give completely different data. Data that's different to the point that if you were marketing director for Sony Ericsson and you switched from doing brands within statements to statements within brands, you'd probably find yourself getting fired as your rating goes down from 70% to 40%. They are completely different questions. What else do grids do? They encourage you to go way too fast. This is uh, some timings of grid items. That's seconds up the side, and it's the red bars down the bottom. Half a second an item is how fast people were processing the items in the grid. When asked as individual questions, they were averaging about eight seconds a question. So that's 16 times slower, 16 times more thinking speed. They encourage you to go too fast. As you go so fast, what you're processing is not the items themselves, but the underlying latent construct in the grid. And that's what leads to straight lining, because all of these items are about Coca-Cola, or about Pepsi-Cola, or about whatever the grid is about. And your attitude towards Pepsi-Cola is what's being measured, not the items. And you get straight lining. You also miss the subtleties and the not-so-subtleties that are put into grids, and you will answer by rule of thumb. So, for example, if in the middle of a large grid, like I've done here, at item 39 or 40, I put a direct instruction to the respondent to code number two here, 14 to 19% of people will fail to do that, and they will just answer the survey in a heuristic. How will they answer the, the survey? Well, for the most part, this is the answer they will give you at the trap question is the answer that they've been giving mostly during the, the grid. So that's described as frequency bias, the most frequent answer is given. And whatever's left over, if we look at those people, they generally tend to give the same answer as the answer they've just given, which is a recency bias to the survey. So they're processing the things too quickly that they're unable to stop and change their mind and to give the correct answer. Anything else wrong with grids? Yes. Uh, we certainly tend to use the wrong scale for the construct that's being asked about. So we might have a question, to what extent do you agree or disagree? This training course is extremely useful, and here's a nice long scale. What we hope to do, and what actually happens, is two different things. You, as the respondent, have to do a two-stage process. One is to decide how useful you're finding this, and then translate that into some agree, disagree, and hopefully it would come out like this, that extremely useful maps over to agree extremely, and you go through all the stages down to extremely disuseful, which you would map to disagree extremely. Now, of course, at this point, you're probably thinking to yourself, what on earth is disuseful? There is no concept of disuseful, because there is no opposite to useful. Something doesn't become disuseful, it just has no use whatsoever. So the reality, perhaps, is extremely useful maps to agree extremely, and the positive sides of the scale become agree, and then not at all useful, which is what people are thinking, is mapped to the rest of the scale, which means we're not measuring the thing that we're trying to measure. If we want to measure attitudes and we want to measure constructs, you want to work out what it is that you're actually trying to measure it, and then decide how that thing is being measured, what use words are used to measure it, is it unipolar or bipolar? Then go and ask the question. 
it's more work for you as the, as the questionnaire designer, but it's an awful lot less work for the respondent, and it's more valid, and it's more reliable. So this is how we should do it. How useful, if at all, did you find this training course? It goes from extremely useful down to not at all useful. So we stay in the construct of useful. And even as you're reading the question, the answer is forming in your mind, and the answer is listed. It's very easy for respondents. Does it have order effects? Well, we've written the scale like this with the, the good thing at the top and the bad thing at the back, at the bottom, and the expectation is that up should mean good. Some research by uh, Roger Tarango, I think he's uh, at uh, Michigan University, so things at the top should be good. The answer speed, it's faster to do it this way around because the expectation of where you find the answer is in the right place than it is when you do it the, wrong, the other way around. Although there is no real order bias. So it's just quicker and easier to do it this way around. Now we might find that we're actually manipulating people by accident when we're doing surveys with them on the grounds that we want to make it more fun. And this is another experiment that I'd like to do with, with groups of people. Let's show them this questionnaire. It's really boring to ask them to respond to those words. Much nicer to show them some lovely pictures. And while you're speaking, and while you're thinking about what your answer is, we just subtly change one of the pictures towards one of the other prettier options, possibly the winter holiday. And you can do this all day, just manipulating people through choice of pictures. When it comes down to the results, you get very different results. Just using the word summer beach, 58% of people said that was their free choice. 60% chose the, the white sand, the blue sky. The blue sea, but only 36% chose the crowded beach. So it's not a good representation of summer beach holiday. And let's not forget what's going to end up in your client's tables: the words summer beach. So using the picture is a very dangerous thing to do. Let's talk a little bit about motivation. Um, we need to motivate the respondents. So we need to have some kind of theory of motivation so we can understand how we ought to do. That I'm going to take you quickly through self-determination theory, which is a psychological theory of motivation, from Fetchy and Ryan. It's grounded in in psychology and in a little bit of philosophy uh, about how people like to act and people like to change. To have tendency towards psychological growth and to integrate experiences. Uh, interestingly, in this theory, the last point: the social context supports or thwarts natural tendencies, so it brings in society into it as well. And they say that motivation is not a fixed state, but is a continuum related to the task in the social context. Uh, continuum relating to the task in the social context, and so not a person. So you're on a fixed state, and this is the, the continuum. And we've made motivation to intrinsic motivation. Things are done for their own reward at intrinsic motivation. Tasks are not done under a motivation. And in the center there, there are a number of um, levels of it extrinsic motivation, regulation, introduction, pressure to avoid guilt. If you read those, uh, those labels, you ask yourself, I wonder where most market researchers, most market research respondents fit, it's probably around the pressure to avoid guilt and to obtain externally imposed rewards, because we lead a lot with rewards. So they're probably around about there, but then if you look at task outcomes and think about where we'd like people to be, when people are finding it interesting and enjoying and are competent at doing things at the far top of the scale, where would we like them to be? We'd like them to be up here. And luckily, this theory tells us how we do that. In order to move people on this motivation continuum, we need to get them to feel these things, autonomy, competence, relatedness, and value. People like you to do this. What you're doing has meaning, and you're good at this, and you're free to choose it. And this, perhaps, is some of the stuff that interviewers used to do that we don't do in online research. Gamification works in online research because it's one of the things that gamification helps us do, to make, make people win at research so they know that they're good at it. So we might choose to introduce our surveys uh, something like this. And I've just highlighted uh, the motivational words, choosing most expert, people like you, people like you. Do it when you're ready, continuing your survey, taking ownership. Simple, easy things to say. No mention of rewards, no mention of threats, though you have to give your honest opinion or we'll throw you out of the panel. 
And it's all positive and it's all, all encouraging. So, I want to summarize this huge journey that we've just taken in 40 minutes. Questionnaire writing is a mixture of art and science. And it's one of the things I think that attracts most people into the, the, the profession of market research. The art of writing well, of motivating respondents, the science of writing precisely and avoiding bias. It's a real skill that we don't push enough. Never forget that everything has meaning and we are supposed to know what everything means in the questionnaires that we design. We design them deliberately to meet the needs of the experiment. There are better ways of asking questions, there are better ways of collecting answers. So I think we might as well do it as best as we possibly can. So if anyone ever says, well, does it really matter, say, well, perhaps not. But wouldn't we rather do it as best as we can than not? I believe that questionnaire writing, and particularly understanding why it is so important, is the thing that sets us as market researchers apart from anybody else working in the field of consumer insight. It has real value. It's not something we should give away lightly. It's not something we should defer lightly to people who don't have this skill, and that would include clients. But that's why it's good to understand why we write the way that we do. And why the concepts of things like validity and reliability are so important and how they can be maximized. Back to my principles then. Respondents know they're in an experiment. Everything they see, hear, or read has been done deliberately and has meaning. So, everything that you write or read or show has to be done for a good reason. They do want to please. That's the questionnaire that motivates the respondent to provide the complete answers and the accurate answers. So, you have to think about motivation. You have to think about communication, the way in which you write. It helps the respondent work out their answers and it makes their life easy rather than difficult. And that's extremely important. I just want to leave you with this before we go to Ray for Q and answers. You know what, if this stuff was easy, there would not be an enormous number of textbooks all about it. There are a huge variety of textbooks on the subject. I would recommend anyone, everyone, to own at least one, if not two of these, and to understand how this thing should be done best. So with that, I'd like to hand over to Ray and take through questions that you may have.